So let's start with curved beams. So the beginning when we were introducing this topic uh, last week, uh, uh, so the difference was that, uh, or the main difference in calculating the stresses that are being, let's say, generated by the external forces applied to a beam uh, are very different if they are a straight beam or a already curved beam. So let me start here. So when we have a in here, yeah, right here. So when we have here a straight beam, so it means that the initial configuration before applying forces and before deforming, so is straight. And there is a theory called, or yeah, theory of Euler-Bernoulli equation is a theory that makes a lot of assumptions, assumptions in the way that it just disregards many, uh, let's put it in this way, phenomena happening inside of the body to come up with an equation that would allow us to relate kind of forces to deformation. Basically, uh, when we talk about forces, forces in, in the form of momentum here, and then the result then is kind of the deformation is a linear deformation in, in a vertical axis here. So in that sense, uh, among those simplifications that you're going to find in the Euler-Bernoulli equation, it's also called, uh, let's say, fundamental uh, equation of engineering or something like that, is that, for example, you're going to consider the formations are pretty small compared to the length of the beam and so on. So, But in reality, you might not have this specific case. So that, that changes a lot. You know, The initial assumptions that you make to develop this theory are kind of fundamental to the results you're going to obtain. So as engineers, when we take this such, let's say, simplified assumptions on, on how to calculate moment, uh, deformations in straight beams. So it's not that it's bad, but we need to understand that this comes from a lot of assumptions. And in each case that we are, say, destined to apply such a formula, it means that we need to consider that if those initial assumptions that were promised to develop this, this formula are kind of valid still here. Let me check this. Perfect. So now, but what happens when the beam is uh, initially not straight, but you know is curved? So a totally different. So all assumptions uh, taken into account in the Euler-Bernoulli equation, you know, fail. Then what we need to do is say, okay, uh, this fails. So what should we do? So that's why uh, there are several other ways to do it. And one of the most popular ones is this uh, Winkler-Bach theory. And if you want to have some sort of, uh, let's say indication when to use this theory with respect to when to use an Euler, uh, Euler Bernoulli equation. Basically, you just compare the radius of curvature of the beam to the depth of the beam, meaning kind of this, uh, this distance here, kind of this height of the beam. It's, yes, it's called depth, but it's height of the beam. So basically, you, you take here, you come here to the, to the beam and say, well, the radius of curvature is this much. And then you compare that to the kind of the this height here. So if this condition applies, then you know it might be advisable to use what is being back theory. Before that, you know, uh, some theories say that well, it's safe to use the simple deformation equation, and when they call it simple deformation equation, they are they're referring to Euler Bernoulli in that sense. In this case, we're going to take an approach of try to. Derive, derive this Winkler back theory. So uh, please be prepared to see a lot of numbers here, uh, a lot of kind of uh, operations, uh, because in the end, what I want to arrive to is to a formula that allows me to calculate the stresses in different parts of, of you know, this uh, complex shape or curved shape beam here. So whenever I pick a point, I say, okay, what are the stresses here? And then if I pick this point, then you know, what is the stress here? And by knowing the stress, so we have already noted that, is that we can calculate, you know, if the part is going to fail or it's going to deform in that sense in the future. To start with that, I'm going to, let's say, start with this. So this is, imagine that this part here is a cut of, you know, this hook or any curved beam. So you have uh, the, let's call it in this way, the, uh, let's say the original or on the form body, and then you have the deformed body. So, but to start kind of act, acting on all of these, you know, we're going to make a few assumptions, about four assumptions. And these assumptions, I'm going to write it down here because they're pretty important to 
condition what we're going to do next. So I'm going to write here assumptions. By the way, if I, for any chance, I just kind of uh, log off from, from Teams, just wait for me and try to, to reconnect. Just in case any problem with the internet or, or similar to that. So let's see. So first, so if we see here by the on the form configuration, configuration or on on strain configuration, meaning that original one when you haven't applied a law. So we're going to talk about uh, a kind of the big B, B, C, and D here. So we're talking about this big part here. So it's kind of really attached to the wall. Let's put it in that way, and the, and the boundaries are these ones here. Then this is a on the form configuration. So you see that this on the form configuration is divided into into. Let me see if I can put first uh, the this one maybe. Don't disturb. Just want to get continue getting notifications here. Anyway, when we have this kind of on the front configuration, so this is divided into planes, kind of into you have, you no, know, for example, A, E, F, D, you have kind of E, G, H, F, and so on. So we are going to assume kind of a few things. So the first one is that kind of those plane sections, those ones are going to remain plane, meaning that there is not going to be any deformation in this direction here, kind of the lateral direction. Um, of course, kind of where, where you're seeing the represented the the kind of the dash part, which corresponds to the deformed configuration, you see kind of evidently smaller, but you know, this is a matter just of visual representation, but according to the assumptions we're going to write down here. So this, the height of this section should be the, the same height of this section. So that's what it means when uh, I say that the plain sections remain plain, you know. Then, second one is that if we're saying that, well, uh, not only that they remain plain, but also that there is not going to be any type of warping or or anything like that. Meaning that the only deformation they are going to find kind of is is just enough you know, in, in the way you see it. So there is not going to be any. If this is the the view here, kind of by looking at it from this this one here. So basically, you are going to see that this is not going, the axis of this is not going to do something like this or kind of it's not going to work in, in such direction, but it's going to just keep, you know, very straight in that sense. Then the other one is that, of course, uh, by consequence of the first thing that I said is that, you know, the radial strain, the additional deformation in the radial direction, you know, no radius tail strain or is very, let's say, negligible. Then we're going to talk about what's the material we're going to use in here. So it's going to be a material that, that obeys the Hooke's law in that sense. So we know that Hooke's law is, has a very characteristic relations between what is strain and stress, you know, and it's represented by a straight line until a certain point where that uh, straightness, you know, varies because of, of its, you know, you just went over the yield stress, stress of, of the material in that sense. So Hooke's law is applied here, and then the material is also isotropic. And for that, you know, that fibers like these represented here can just, you know, expand and contract without any type of, let's say, restrictions from the other fibers, you know. With respect to the other fibers. Good. So let's take a look at this uh, at this on the form configuration, the red one here, the one that is marked there. So the idea would be to understand how this is deforming, and then 
using Hooke's law or the constitutive equation, uh, understand how stresses are produced due to the effect of deforming the, the material. But we're going to start not with a deformation, we're going to start with a strain. So in this sense, we're going to say, okay, if this is straining in this way, so what's the stress produced by this amount of strain here? So this is going to be a little bit kind of a long procedure, but it's very interesting in that sense that we're going to arrive to a formula that would allow us to calculate stresses, as I mentioned, in, in any point of the, of the curved beam uh, just by knowing what are the forces applied to the beam and, you know, and certain uh, area or section characteristics of the beam. And then, you know, you would, you would get that. So the, the geometry of the beam, put it in that way. So to start working with this, uh, one of the, you're going to see different types of derivation of the Winkler-Bach uh, theory. And the most, say, basic uh, or fundamental way to start this is to start asking, you see that we have here, this is a beam, and then this curve already. So if we notice at this point here, so we're going to have a radius of curvature R from, from some point, uh, we don't, it's not important at the moment, to a point here. So this R is representing the radius of curvature to the centroidal axis of the beam, okay? So centroidal axis. Now, we don't know uh, how, where is the centroidal axis at the moment, and we are not interested to know right now, but we know to start kind of, we need to, to start this derivation of the formula by saying, okay, I need to know where the centroidal axis of this beam is here. And we all know that centroidal axis is determined by the, you know, the geometry of the section, in that sense. And then, so it would be equivalent to say, okay, more or less, you know, I come here, this is something, it's come from, this is the radius R, and then it comes to this point here, and then I'm going to measure one distance more to another fiber, and measure by y, and then after the fiber y, I'm going to just pick a small, let's say, uh, differential of, of distance, kind of a small delta y. Because in order to be able to determine uh, stresses at any point in the in, across the, the area of the curved beam, I need to kind of have some general equation that allows me to relate any point of across the section of the beam with the distance from certain point. So that's why the generalization goes like this. Then the first, let's say, question that it is asked, okay, okay, so this is a straining because there are certain, this, this is a moment applied here. I'm going to delete this one so it doesn't cause any confusion. It does. Uh, So the question is, okay, uh, so this is in the on strain configuration. I'm going to write it like this or put it from here from to here. So this is on strain. But when I apply the moment, this is going to be strained and it's going to change up to kind of this part here. So it's not allowing me to pick colors. Yeah, no. So again, so we have the EF uh, distance, radial distance, or circumferential distance, and then I'm going to, let's say, apply a moment, and that moment is going to cause a deformation in the part, and then it's not going to be long, it's not any longer kind of EF, but it's going to be E to F prime here. So the first question is, okay, uh, how much is the strain? So, so after applying the moment, so how the length change, kind of the length or the unidimensional length that is called the strain, so how did it change? So is there a way to calculate it? Well, let's see. So if I call this the first one. Circumferential kind of strain. This, uh, let's say, I don't know what, this is kind of blue or magenta or something. So what's the definition of strain? You know, if I know that, that the, the longitude of that circumferential longitude of that uh, fiber changed. Well, I know that is going to be kind of the, the form length or circumferential length minus the deform or the undeformed, undeformed uh, circumferential length divided by the original one, kind of is this one here. So if I do a little bit kind of rearranging, it's going to be EF divided by EF minus one. 
Now, but I can define the circumferential length in terms of the radius of curvature uh, for, of that part and the angle, you know, that is measured from the beginning of this wall till the, when the, the part, you know, ends. So, for example, for EF, I should have, well, I have to have changed the color, but EF is going to be equal to EF prime, let's put it in the way. So, if EF prime, is going to be measure change just to keep a concordance of colors. So EF, the green one, measure from here, is going to be equal to the radius from the curve, radius of curvature till kind of the, 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 the fiber, and that's going to be R1 plus Y1 multiplied by theta. No, no, this is the correct color for this one. And then we also know that EF is going to be then, this is the radius of curvature R plus Y multiplied by phi, this, this angle here. When I combine all, all of those equations, change colors here, so not to confuse things, the strain in that fiber is going to be and kind of just repeating everything that you have there. Minus one. So let's let's mark this as a kind of as our one important equation. Now, Hooke's law, we said that this, this material is going to comply with Hooke's law. So basically means that this strain is going to be equal to a stress apply and then their Young's modules or materials modules of this part here, of this body here. Now, what happens if we consider another, uh, let's say, fiber here. So let's consider the fiber GH and let's consider the fiber GH prime. Move a little bit up. I'm going to call that to use the same colors GH here equals to R times phi. And I'm going to say using the other color that GH prime equals to R1 theta. Write this better. So I can form another strain to measure how much elongated this, you know, from the original configuration by calling it, for example, EC prime, and that's going to be equal to, by substituting this value kind of in the same like this here, so I can write it again. So GH prime minus GH divided by GH, which is the original length, and that's going to give me, if I apply the same conversion as above, it's going to be R1 theta divided by R phi minus one. Now, one of the reasons this is done is because there are a bunch of unknowns and uh, we need to try to figure out how to combine those unknowns into quantities that would allow me to proceed in the formulation so we can get rid of them and ended up just by considering geometry and forces uh, applied to the to the beam. So to that sense, I could combine a few things. For example, I can know that, or if I take it from, say, from this part here, so I can take, the, I can look at the relationship between the, the two angles, theta and phi here. So I can call kind of work with that, and I can say that, for example, if I take everything to, if I try to leave just the value of for example, theta divided by phi, that would be something like, like you know, I just move 
this one here, plus one. Then I multiply it times r phi, and that's equal r1 theta. Then when I just try to find that relationship between angles, this is going to be something like r c1 plus one divided by r1 minus one. And let me just write down also this as an important equation because we need to be referring back to that. Because now, if you see these two equations that we're working here, if I call it this, for example, one and this two, then it would be kind of, so what would happen if I, okay, now if I don't use this, uh, let's say angle relationship here, I could just base my own, my whole, let's say formulation so far, only on terms of the radius of curvature and some deformation. So what, if, what, what happens if I could, let's say, include this into this part here? So equation two into equation one. So let's see. So if I do that to move here and to have that, Equation one is going to remain basically the same, but so let me write it like this. But this is going to be now multiplied by this relationship here. Sorry, this, this is not a one here. Correctly. And all of this, this is multiplied, all of this minus one. So if we remember that we said that uh, uh, there is no ra radial strain, meaning that there is no deformation in this direction here. So that means that there is not such a difference, there is no such a difference between y and y1. So we can say that, okay, because of the assumption we have just you know, uh, mentioned at the beginning, so y is going to be equal to y1 because there is no radial uh, strain or deformation in that in that direction there. So if that's the case, so let me then change everything to comply with that. It's going to be then the same as before. Minus one. What questions do you have so, so far? So far, it's just a bunch of numbers and try to figure out how to get from one hype, one, let's say, uh, case or supposed, let's say, a representation to what we want to get you know, as a general formulation for the Winkler-Bach theory. So, what questions do you have at the moment? If you have questions now. Could you go through what you mean by the assumption that plane sections remain in plane? I didn't quite understand that. Yeah, so let's put it in the way when you have a, a beam. So let me try to draw something in 3D. So let's, let's well, the, the most simple example is taking a, a, a straight beam. So if you have a, an I beam, it would be something like this. Uh, let me just try kind of. Just on, draw something in 3D. So this is a straight beam. Imagine that it's kind of just thrown in 3D. Yeah. So when you apply a force in the middle, so you're assuming that this, this middle section here is just going to deform in one direction, meaning that if you see it from this side here, yeah. What you're going to see is only a straight line, kind of. It's going to be deformed, but it's going to be a straight line. Yeah. So this is going to, this might deform in this way, three dimensionally. But what you're going to see when you see it from the lateral side, you're going to see that this, this is just a straight line. Uh, when I say that plane sections remain plane, meaning that if I take a, a zoom at this, and then, you know, I say, well, I'm going to make a kind of put a magnifier. Magnifying, uh, magnifying glass here. So I'm going to say that this section is represented by 
you know, planes. I guess it's kind of represented here. So you're going to have three planes, one plane and two planes. Yeah. So when this deforms, these planes remain the same. So meaning that they are not going to deform in the way that is going to be something like this. Kind of something like this or something like this. See? So they remain planes and they are kind of they are not going to be uh, warping in any case. Let me try to find a figure that I could, you know, use to represent it better. So you mean the top face and the bottom face of the eye bar remain in parallel? Not that remain parallel, but they are not warping. Let me show you what I mean by warping. A warping beam. Just a second. So it would be something like warp. Try to look for a figure for you. Yeah, maybe I got it. Yeah. Something like this. Yeah. So this is specifically what isn't occurring. Yeah, this is what is not. We're assuming that it's not going to occur there. Yeah. Right. OK, I think I understand yeah. now. OK, good. All right. Now, so we get here. So if you get to see how is the derivation of the Winkler back theory, so you're going to find kind of a very limited or very yeah limited information in the sense of how things are gotten from the previous ones. So there is a, a jumping steps from you no know, from from one point to another, meaning that you don't know what exactly was done in order to get the results that they were at they were getting there. So in that sense, uh this is one of the things that I have been kind of thinking that when people started working on this type of theories, you know, now that we see it, now that they have done it and they have developed it, and then they have, you know, shown us how to how the situation goes. So it looks simple, you know, it looks obvious sometimes. However, uh, when you face these type of problems for the first time, and then you start doing from scratch, from zero, any type of derivation, say, like, okay, how should I continue? So what should I do with this? What's the next step? You no, know, should I follow to to get to what I want to 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 go? So in that sense, I assume that on these cases there was a lot of trial and errors, you know, a lot of let's say continuing developing or formulating uh, this uh, this theory in one direction, and they found out that they got they have gotten nowhere, so they have to back up and start you know working on a different direction to see mathematically if that's possible, and then you know many trials and error. But of course now that I'm going to show you in this moment is something that. Uh, you could say, okay, how how could you figure that out? You know, from as, from for, as a first from from the moment zero from the first instant. Well, it's not. So you have to do a lot of iterations to to go from this step to to what I'm trying to what, what you're going to see kind of in in the following two steps. You know, for example. So in here, what we're going to do next is to say separate this. I'll try to separate everything and try to to turn it into uh, say a more uh, how to call it. Uh, let's say more workable situation. It's going to be weird, but you know, just bear with me. So we have it uh, here. Something is missing. No. Okay. So then we're going to have that right here. You see, kind of that strain. I'm going to manipulate this for us. I'm not going to do anything else. I'm just going to try to. Uh, remove these R's that are this radius or of curvature that are appearing outside of the parentheses here. So, so you're going to find that if you multiply, for example, these by all of these equations or do a kind of a straight multiplication of that, you're going to find this result here. So this is basically, if you just kind of, you know, send this R to the bottom of this part to the denominator, and then, you know, you put this R, you know, dividing this, 
or is a div div divider of these, you know, numerators. So you're going to get to this relationship here. So, so now this is the weird part. So in order to continue, we need to do some strange um, manipulations here. So I'm going to write it down so you have it for you there and you can check it out uh, that, you know, we're going to add and we're going to subtract this quantity. So if I if I kind of do this, I can say after I I kind of uh, expand. Let's put it in this way. This term here. So we're going to have here. You see the strain is going to be kind of you know one times one and so on. It's going to be one plus or one times write it better plus y r one minus one by o r and then this is going to be divided by this term here it remains present denominator So then if I add and subtract this term here to the bottom of this equation there, you're going to have So now I'm eliminating here kind of the one with minus one. So that's a good choice there. So this is going to continue like R1 plus the strain in the bottom fiber plus y r1 minus y r. Then this is kind of where I add these three ones, these 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 terms here minus this one, the same one. So I'm not changing the equation at all. So I'm just adding these two terms there. So about these notifications. And then this is divided by this one here. Change this. Now I'm going to group similar terms terms because I want to find out what's the value of the strain in the upper fiber kind of in terms of the strain of the bottom fiber and the radius of curvature and of course the distance between the the centroidal axis and the point we are analyzing there or the distance to the fiber so in that sense we're going to have kind of just getting some common terms here And divided by this. Finally, what I'm going to do here is just I'm going to just remove, uh, kind of put in a just a order, a little bit kind of more order way this equation here. And I'm basically divide, dividing each one of these terms by by this one. So if I divide this term by this one, this is going to be cancelled out. Then you know I don't do it here, but I just keep it the same. And then it's just a little bit of work here. This can be this one. And I'm going to mark this one as an important equation that we're going to come back. It'll be bigger.
Now the question is, okay, now that I know that, or that I have postulated in the beginning that the stress, or let me write it as I put it in the beginning, that strain equals stress divided by the materials kind of modulus or coefficient. Yeah, that sense. So it's striking for here that stress that one of the parameters I want to find equals uh, E times the strain. So would it be that if I just multiply all of these times the strain uh, times E give me the formula I'm looking for, or at least it's, it's getting me closer to a way to calculating stresses at any point of the cross section of the beam, of the curved beam. So let, let's see. So the, the, the tensile stress, I'm going to write, yeah, tensile stress. Now I'm calling it tensile stress because uh, if I assume that the, as in the straight beam, that the centroidal axis is at this point here, to mark it again, and I'm measuring the, the stress at this point here, and with this moment applied in this kind of direction, this fashion, then I'm, I'm pretty safe to assume that there is going to be a tense uh, tension in this side of the of the beam, sorry, to over the the center of the axis. So that's why is here kind of calculated as tensile stress. Put it back. So to write it down completely, tensile stress is going to be a long one. So sigma equals basically e multiplied by all of these that you had in the, the beginning. Try to copy it. This one, this one. But still, I don't know uh, what are the values of the of the strains, uh, the good thing is that I could find the tensile stress in function of a uh, strain and in function of the radius of curvature. So I can measure radius of curvature. Uh, you know, I can you know have the value of y, but the strain is a bit tricky to calculate. So I need to, to keep to continue working with this. So bear with me in this. Uh, always at the previous in the previous class, the explanation to all of these numbers are presented at the end. Kind of, you know, how can I use? You know, this is not useful yet. All right, so let's see what happens with the force. So if I use the concept of force, still not useful. So what's the force applied on the surface? Force on the section, let's put it in that way. Now that force equals for this case or for this specific case to the integral of the stress times you no, know, the variation or how the, 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 the area variates. And if I try to bring kind of, as a, I believe if I have it here, this one. So I'm going to copy this one here. Copy it all, maybe. See what it brings. Yeah. Now, if I understand this, so I can say, okay, so what's the value of the force in the section? So the value of the force is going to be equal to sigma, which I already calculated here, at times, you know, the area. So I'm going to split up this equation, big equation here, and put it in the form of kind of within the integral that you have there. So as E is multiplying everything is constant, so I'm going to leave it out of the of the integrals. So I'm going to have that the force in the section is going to be equal to E times something. There is the integral of this part. Plus the integral of kind of all this part, you know, times dA.
to divide it by this term. It does not disappear that easily. This is times dA. But if I try to integrate, you know, terms that are not constant with terms, you know, and, and, and take out terms that are constant, constant, I'm going to find that, sorry, another, another notification is coming, so sorry about that. So I'm sorry, to, can I ask, yeah? why is there no denominator for the first part, for the first integral? That it doesn't have y1 plus y over r underneath. Let, let me check in the back. Ah, uh, no, because I, there is a, an error here in this equation. So this is basically when you do this, when you, I oh, write I back because I extended the line too much. Yeah, so thanks for noticing. Yeah, when, when I mentioned that this is going to be kind of divided into this, so this cancels out. So, so that's good. That's a good catch. Thank you. Let me just fix it on all of this. Yeah, now we're good. Yeah, so we were here and then, so this is not dependent on the kind of on the area. So I can take this out. E strain times A plus, then, you know, what I can take out from here are it's basically this term here. And then what else? Uh, this term here, I can take it out and then it would just remind the Y's and the A's. So it would be E again because E was as a multiplier times one plus this one here, yeah, times one, plus one here. integral of y divided by one plus y divided by a by r times the a. Let me move this a little bit and uh, see. So it's not that in the top. Yeah. And then let, we'll mark it also, it's important. So we got this, so we have, okay, the force in the section depends on the strains, depends on the material, depends on the radius of curvature and the, on the form and the form configuration and depend on then the distance from the centroidal axis so splitting the way to the point we are, to the fiber we are measuring there and the area for sure, so geometry in that sense. Now, what would happen with the, if I try to do the same, sorry about this notification, I try to, to cancel them, but uh, if I close this one, So if I kind of calculate the moment of this, now applying the same, so what will be the moment on the area? So I know that we, I'm applying a moment to the bar, so there is that moment equals kind of, or, or I can calculate it in the way that moment equals to the integral of the force time a distance. So I would write like this. So these two form the force, and this is the distance to the fire. Fiber. Basically, what well, that's what it's saying. So, if I apply the same formula, meaning I'm introduced uh, E, Y, and all of that, so I'm going to end up with just to not mess around with the formula because we have already an integral there. So, I don't want to apply another integral on top of that. So, I will apply it on that, on this one here. So, this is going to be the top bit. Put it here, try to just uh, deconstruct this. So, so, moment equals to then it's going to be this multiplied or integrated and then multiplied by y and d. So, the first term, first term is going to be this times this or the integral of this times y. So, it's something like this e integral of this y the a 
because this is the first term. And then the second term would be then E that multiplies all of that you have in the other part. This, this has a kind of, this has some specific name that we're going to be noticing after that. So this is going to be this. If I try to exclude, exclude everything at once, no, let's put it in this way. So this could leave E, e out, but doesn't matter. So then I square DA, and not to make it more messy, messier. I, all of these. One, Y divided by R. So I'm going to rearrange a little bit this so it gets a little bit better. So the first thing uh, I'm going to just point out, and it's going to follow us during the, the whole kind of a derivation, is that the product of Y times DA alone or itself, you know, it's going to be, let's say, closer to zero, very small. So this whole term, you know, is going to disappear. So those differentials like that, like that is going to be, so we are going to consider that's kind of, that is not important in that sense. So then considering that, we're going to have that, and cleaning all this out, that E constant, uh, this is constant, this is constant, and then, you know, we're going to end up with one plus And then this is going to be multiplying the integral of y squared divided by this one here times dA. So I have to delete this one here. Now, this is a term that has been kind of with us uh, at some point. So meaning that if we wanted to know the, the, the moment kind of uh, applied or yeah it's not the moment applied but it's kind of uh, the equation of moment in function of the material properties and in function of the deformation so there is something here that might be tricky to to let's say to calculate but there is a method there is a kind of this is transformed into a almost tabulated coefficient that you're going to find in the literature and it's going to have a specific or a very characteristic name so if i take Kind of just play with this part here, and I say, okay, after in integrating everything, so let's imagine that this part here, actually let me mark it with a different color. This part here, so I'm going to do something with that. So I'm not, I don't want to carry it, so I will call that y or the integral of y squared divided by one plus y divided by r dA. It's going to be, I'm going to call it that it's going to to be something you know called a area times h square. So h square is something that you're going to find in the literature as you know constant of the cross section of the bar, kind of or, or bars. Let's put it bars cross section constant and. Depending on the, the geometry of the section, h squared is going to acquire uh, different values. There is a way to calculate, uh, to calculate you know, analytically h squared. We're going to try to do an example kind of today, but you're going to notice also that you know, this is something that is, is, is doable, kind of, let's say it's already tabulated, meaning that if you, ha if you have a very well-known rectangular or trapezoidal or circular section, or even a section similar to the hook here, hook here so for this hook, there is a specific h square, you know, or cross section a coefficient or constant that you have, you need to know. And Winkler-Bach theory relies on that you know uh, what's that h square or h, yeah, h square, you know, constant. It's constant because well, it doesn't change for the square for the section. Now, now, now. So if I wanted to then apply what I have just said to put a little bit the equation of moment a little bit more, let's say, uh, simpler in that sense. So I could try, I could say that then the moment 
equals to everything that you have here. So this. Yeah, E times times this, times this, and then this is going to multiply by this term that we call it A times H square. So uh, one, one important point here. So when we are calculating H square, so H square is a number that comes you know, already. So it's not that it's a number that, that, that you have to square it you know, or power of two, no. It's just a, it's H square is something that already comes you know, from the calculation and is the, the term. You know. uh, if you ask me right now, what's the reason for that? So I don't have a straight answer of why they called it H square. But you know, it's not something again, you know, very important because many of the, let's say, not mistakes, but you know, uh, considerations that are, are done while solving these type of exercises is that people consider that you know they have to calculate H and then square it. You no, know, and what you get is straight away this H square. So so uh, please, you know, just you know, keep an eye on that. Good. Now, now, what do we do here? So there is, I mentioned that there was a term that was always with us and then it's a, some sort of you know, causing a mess, but we need to work on that so, so we can have more clear equations on the, also on the force size. So, so the moment now, okay, depends on the strain and depends on you know, geometry of the, of, the, of the curvature and then area and then you know, the constant. But now when we look at the force, so force is determined by, you know, by kind of the same, close to the same parameters, but we have this term here, you know, this integral of y divided by this term here, and then multiply by dA. So let's take a look at that and see what can we do with that term so we can say work it better or try to put it in the same representation of this one. So to that end, let me just bring back this, this one here, just this part here. This one. It's just kind of this term here is kind of pretty similar to this one. So there's should there be a way that I could convert this into this type of shape or something like that? So let me put a just a mark here. Of course there is, you know, because I haven't telling you already, so there is in that sense. So. I can call this, and if I do something like, um, first let me rearrange a little bit this. So I can transform this uh, differently, and then I can say, well, this is equal or equals to the integral of kind of putting the R, this R at the beginning, or uh, kind of in the numerator, numerator, and this one also here. So basically multiplying this times this, and then you know putting the this is dividing, putting it back to the to the top the A. And then again, you know, one of the worst things that you say, how these guys, you know, came up with these ideas. So now we're going to add and subtract, you know, uh, for Y2. So we're not going to change uh, the Y square, the equation at all. Just rearranging. So this is going to be then the integral of Ry plus Y square minus y square and this is going to be divided by this term here and multiplied by dA. Then if I kind of uh, convert this into or use kind of common terms and try to kind of uh, let's say isolate this small part here so this first part of the equation here the integral. So this is going to be equal to that r plus y. So if I take common factor multiplying y, and this is going to be divided by this r plus y minus i squared divided by this one. So I think they can cancel this out. Then this integral is going to be, and this is all going to be multiplied by dA. to be left out with integral of and that is y minus y square minus r plus 
Why? The A. Now, this term is pretty similar to what we're having here, so we are getting closer to somehow. If I keep separating this uh, integral into, let's say, if its terms, you know, I'm going to notice that something again is happening. So I'm going to continue with this. So I'm going to have the, the first term is going to be the integral of y times dA. And we mentioned that that's going to be no, no, negligible in that sense. And minus uh, these other terms, which, which is going to be the integral of y squared minus r plus y times dA. Now, this here, uh, if I wanted to see, well, uh, but you know what? If I wanted to try to take it to the same way that we have it here, so this is not the same. So, well, uh, it's kind of easy because, you know, you see that we came from basically this part to this part. So, well, let's see if we can come back to, to this shape here. So, so whatever we are ending up, ending up here, so it's kind of similar to what we have here. So, just bear with me. So, I can say that uh, on the part, to pretty detail that r plus y, if I multiply that times r and divide by r, I'm going to end up with some, end up with something like you know plus y divided by r. Yeah. So then if I substitute that back to this equation here, so then this segment that I'm trying to figure out how to put it in, in known terms, so it's going to be this. Yeah, so it's going to be y square. I bring everything like this to the to the bottom. R, the A. Then we can say that this what we have here, this thing here, is similar to this thing here. Yeah. And this means also that this thing here, if I try to work it out a little bit better, so I can use a known term, so I can, you know, the radius is not variating or affecting in a way that you know, I cannot take it, I couldn't take it from the integral. So this is going to be equal to this. So I'm just taking R away or out of the integral, and then this is going to end up being one minus Y divided by R, the A. And we know that this term here is this term here. So I can change this into minus one divided by R A H. A H square. Which means that if I then put this back into the force equation that I had somewhere at the beginning here, I substitute all of these in the force equation. Uh, let me write it down so we don't get lost with the where we're putting back things, you know. Force equation, equation, yeah. So I'm going to have then that force equals. I should bring it because I don't really if I had brought it before, but no. Bring all of this. This one. Yeah. So it's going to be. This stays the same, but uh, the only thing I'm going to change is it's better if I. Just move it. From here. And I say, well, you know what now this part that was trying to figure out going to be removed. But this is going to be, say, changed by first the term, the sign is changed because now we have a minus here. And then I have to write here, A H squared divided by R. It's still not useful. Still not useful, but we're closer. We're way closer. Now, 
if we say that uh, plain sections remain plain, and basically that there is not, no, it's not that plain sections remain strain, but also that there is not any, um, let's say, strain in the in the lateral kind of in the yeah in the in this radial direction. So if there is no strain here, it means that the force applied to that, or according to our assumptions, the force applied radially to this beam is not causing anything there. So we can consider that if it's not causing any type of strain as a result of the application of a, of a let's say, radial force to that a beam here, or something like this. So there is no such a force because there is force because there is no any radial strain. So we can say that this force is approximately equal to zero because there is no there is no effect strain effect you know due to forces there, and if that's the case, then I can say okay then all of this equals zero. So right here, no force in radial direction. So it means that then I can operate with this and say, well, no, this is zero. And then all of this, you know, what stays here. So E, so this train, this part here. Minus one R, A, H squared divided by R. Now, thanks to this assumption, so we are eliminating one unknown that, you know, it would be difficult to find out there. So if I then, you know, Put one of these terms, you know, to the other side, and simplify a little bit the equations. And let me do that here. So I'm going to say that E. So it's seem better what has been done. Same term here. A H square constant divided by R. So I can eliminate from this two things. So I can eliminate E. And I can eliminate also kind of the area here. And then what is happening is that we're going to end up saying that you no, know, that circumferential strain that we use as a product for, for let's say, to calculate all these stresses uh, or the, to calculate the stress that we want to, to know at a certain point or, or fiber within the beam is going to be equal to this. One H squared divided by R. Yeah. Now I'm going to keep, uh, let's say, uh, using this because there is something in the moment that I could use there. So, let's see, yeah. Okay. Let me show you. If I combine uh, or try to combine, kind of, I'm going to put everything on one side, kind of what is this A, C, prime R divided by H square. So equals to the rest. A, C prime. Yeah. And I'm going to mark this as a, Kind of important equation because I'm going to bring it back later. Yeah. So look at this. So this term here, one plus the strain in the in the bottom fiber on the fiber which is aligned with the centroidal axis, you know, plus this relationship, is something that appears also in the moment equation here. So if I bring this moment equation. To copy it to this part here. So this term here disappears, basically, because that term can be substituted by equation that is this one. This one, this term here, so is strain times R divided by h square. Let me move this, move this a little bit more. And this is something that kind of keeps canceling also. You know, to move it here. And then definitely you know that, that this is going to, 
So this is going to cancel out. And then this is going to be equal to E strain A. Yeah. Meaning that if I want to know how much is that strain, I can just take it from that place there, from that equation and say, okay, strain in that sense equals to the moment, material properties, and geometry. So now, at this point, let's say we are able to say that strain, that the strain in the, in the centroidal axis, it can be calculated from the moment, from the material properties and from the geometry of this moment, forces applied, E, material properties, and you know R, which is a radius of curvature and area. So those are uh, geometric characteristics of the whole part or the whole body that we're having there. But if I have that, then uh, it means that I could say calculate something like let me let me go back. So uh, to matter of sigma. Sigma just move this because this is for an example. Yeah. So now, seeing from the fact that uh, sigma was or equaled. I was trying to find a word, but I lost it. That's a bunch of equations. That sigma equal this stress times E, meaning that E times is just to find that out. This one here. Sorry, but I just lost the equation. Yeah, this one. The inside of stress equation. Is it here? Yeah. So now I know that let me delete this one here. That this term here is this one here. So I can rewrite this and say that sigma. equals to E times EC, but EC prime or the strain in the in the central axis is defined by this. So I can write it right away as M divided by AR, then times or plus, sorry, E multiplied by this term here. But let's remember that we have also is kind of the strain here. So we need to substitute it again here. So this is going to be E plus one plus the strain, the strain is represented here. Times one. Or one minus R by N divided by. One plus Y R. separate this. Good, so we're getting to something. So so now uh, we have, we can do some substitutions here and we're going to do it, but now we're kind of now putting the stress in terms of the moment of forces applied and geometry, basically all of that. So we don't have any 
uh, so far strange number that we are that we won't be able to calculate. But all of these faults, all of these you know manipulations and everything is to take us to the part that the stress is now in function or is function of the moment, a uh, geometry and you know a material properties here. So let me kind of uh, write it a little bit more so we know uh, a little bit more. It's, it's clear to see what's happening here. So I'm going to work with this part here and I'm going to call it something like. Again, this is it's going to stay the same. So it's becoming a little bit useful. So let's see. I can multiply, for example, on this term here. E. Yeah, times all of these, then E times this. I'm going to write it down. So it's going to be E. Right with me. M. The other way around. Go first, I need to multiply this. I need to do something to separate this all. E times E, E times just a second. Let me just reframe here. But this is one of the, the trickiest part to transform from this to a very kind of kind of the final equation itself. So So yeah, there is a substitution here that these two terms, what you have here, uh, we have already noted that uh, let me search it again. This is EC, where is it located? Yeah, this one here. So this equation here, EC prime marked as here, so let me just put it in here, probably. Yeah, and then I can substitute, for example, to arrange this. So a bunch of flying equations. So if I take this one here, see this. This ones. I'm right here. Yeah. Yeah. So if I try to combine with this one here, so you're going to find a very fast substitution that I'm going to present here because uh, there is one step that I'm going to jump is that. Sigma is, uh, let's say, stress is going to be equal to moment times all divided by this plus this is going to transform to by uh, using this equation, singularity equation. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be transformed to E. Kind of to the part that was kind of I was missing to to get to where I wanted to go was this one this square and this is going to be multiplied by just going to transform again I can use this equation to say that this is equal to two AR plus E M E A R R times R divided by H square. This one. Now let me just move away. 
can remove from here. Yeah. And then finally, a step closer would be transforming a little bit is that that equation. This part here. It's gone. But if I transform the if I multiply, if I multiply by R, R, uh, on the, this part of the equation here only. So this is going to end up being start to find similar terms times one divided by h square r y divided by one y r. So and the reason to do this is because we can then extract similar terms and say that the moment that's the kind of the stress if I just take you know common um, factor this m divided by a r this is going to be end up saying that you know that the sigma at any point or depending on where you choose where to measure it or the stress is going to be equal to the moment you know, the, the, the geometry of the part and then also you're going to take out take, consider that you know it's going to be r square times yeah times a square by divided by by r better better This here, kind of this equation after coming is the first, let's put it in the way, usable, not the first, this is going to be the second, the first one I'm going to show you which one it is. This is the first usable equation that you have at your disposal to calculate the stresses at any point of the of the beam, of the curved beam that is above the centroidal axis. So meaning that this equation here is the one that you're going to use to calculate uh, the stresses on a curved beam uh, in the tension tension part of the of the equation. So whatever, so whenever you take this equation and apply it to any side above, for example, here the this this line here, I'm going to put it in which color to mark it with highlighter. Kind of any equation, any kind of yeah, any stress that you want to calculate in a curved beam above this part or in the highlighted part this part is going to be in tension and i'm going to mark as the part below as the part that's going to be in compression so let me mark it here compression however that formula that we just got is not the one that we need to apply for compression there is a slightly Kind of small change in signs so basically if you want to calculate the part in compression so any point that is below the centroidal, centroidal axis so you're going to say that you know the sigma so basically what's going to change is this sign here and the ch signs change or the sign here so basically you're just letting the equation know that the point is below the y-axis of course that depends on the how you measure the y-axis no we need to be careful with that so but if i want to write it in those terms so the stress in compression is going to be equal to, it's going to be pretty similar, well, in, in shape, but you know, minus R square divided by H square, and then I multiply by, by this one. I'm going to mark it here. So guys, all of this, this time is to tell you that these are the two equations you need to use to calculate things. Your, these are kind of the second and third usable equation here. And all of kind of everything that started with the assumption of a beam that was already curved uh, for assumptions, meaning that you know plane stations remain plane, there is no radial strains, uh, therefore there is not any, let's say, deformation in the in the radial axis, in the radial direction or transversal direction to the beam. That the material obeys Hooke's law and is isotropic. And then you know that the fibers, those are, are separated by lines there in that figure, can expand and contract without any, let's say, any limitations or restriction from the other fibers. 
So starting from that and started kind of asking, what are the, the strains, how the stress the strains are formed after applied a moment there? So we join, well, we, we, we kind of follow this journey just to find out that yes, it is possible to know that and that no, if you want, you need first to consider what's the neutral axis or the, yeah, well, uh, this is a good thing. So we, we have been talking about, you know, centroidal axis, and it's pretty clear that that in straight beams, the centroidal axis, you know, is coincident with the neutral axis. So let me let, let me draw something here. Yeah. So if I have a straight beam here, and I want to draw the centroidal axis, change the colors of this. Not necessarily the centroidal axis is at the middle of the of the beam. You know, it could be that it depends on the shape. So if I want to draw that centroidal axis like this, kind of this is a centroidal axis. It is pretty common to say that this here, the centroidal axis in straight beams corresponds to the neutral axis of the beam. And neutral axis of the beam uh, is reference to that fiber, you know, that is coincident with that axis where there is no deformation. So, and is there is no deformation, then we can explicitly say, kind of as a consequence or or a cause for that no deformation, is that the stress on that neutral axis is, is zero. So, in straight beams, uh, this is pretty clear, and this is a fundamental part of our calculations when we just, you know, are working with straight beams. Now. In curved beams, uh, one important question would be if the centroidal axis is coincident with the neutral axis. So I have been saying so far that, yeah, it is tension if it's above the centroidal axis and it is compression if it's below the centroidal axis, it's not, well, depending on how the, the bar or the beam is loaded. But I might be wrong because could there be the possibility that for curved beam, beams, the centroidal axis is not the same as the neutral axis. So this is something that we need to find out. And we need to find it out. Well, now that we found out how much is the stress or how much can we, or how can we calculate the stresses, you know, depending on the geometry and everything of that, and we might have, you know, most of all these characteristics, then what happens if I try to find out uh, what's the position of, or the Y position of this formula, for example, if the stress is equal to zero? So let's see. Let, let, let's take a let's take a look because this is one important question to see if if it's the same kind of if the central axis is if equal to equals to the neutral axis. And then I'm going to tell you after we determine that. So how the stresses are distributed, you know, across the section because something that we have learned is that if I have this such beam and this beam is, for example, you know, simply supported here, and I apply a force. I know that in the middle of the section or here, so this is going to be in compression, this is going to be in tension. So this, this is going to be something like this. So I'm going to have a line and we have we've known that, well, depending on where this central equal to the neutral axis is located for straight beams. So this is going to be in tension and this is going to be in compression. Yeah. So these are kind of you no know, kind of arrows here. One part is larger than the other because I draw the neutral axis, you know, below the center of the of this, but you know, you get the idea. But what's what's the situation with this? You know, is it the same with the curve beam? Well, let's check it out. So, what happens if I consider that you know, right here, uh, neutral axis? And I'm going to move this. This is for the other example. One. So to find out where the neutral axis is, I need to say, well, use one of these formulas to say, okay, give me you know, the data when the stress is equal to zero. Because that's the sole representation of what a neutral axis is in this type of deformation problems. So if that's so, I'm going to take the tension formula and I'm going to say that uh, if that's equal to zero, then it is true 
that M divided by AR and multiplies this big you know, thing here, as A square uh, Y divided by I plus y, R, y plus R or R plus Y is the same commutative. And this is equal to zero. This has kind of, this equation has a trivial solution where the trivial solution is that if this is equal to zero, this is a trivial solution. However, if we're working on a case that is loaded and has a physical geometry, so this is never going to be equal to zero for our cases. So to, for this equation to become equal to zero, it has to mean, it means that this or what is inside of here has to be equal to zero. So let me, let me take it out. So that is that one plus R squared divided by H squared This is equal to zero. So that's a non-trivial solution in this, in this case. If I work it out a little bit, so I'm going to find out that, well, I'm going to put the one in one side. Mm, square. Equal minus, minus one. And then I'm going, I'm going to multiply things and Put things in the other side of the, of the equation. So that is R square Y. Sorry. R square Y. Yeah. So I multiply this times this, and then this times this, I put it to the other side. So it's going to be equal to H squared minus H squared times Y plus R, which I can open up and say minus H square R. We're going to see why I'm doing this. H square Y. Sorry, I just R times Y. So if I put Y's in one side, so I'm going to have R square Y plus H square Y equals this other kind of remaining part here, minus R H square. Then now I can know the values Y. So Y equals to take common factor here, and then you know whatever is remaining, send it back, send it down to the other side. So H square Y divided by, sorry, minus R H square divided by R square minus or plus H square. I'm going to mark it here. So that's the position of the neutral axis, meaning that axis where the stress is, well, there's no formation, then we assume that there's no stress is affecting that area. Uh, but you see now that uh, it says that it's negative. So it's negative because it is below, as I used the tension formula to try to locate where the neutral axis was, the result is giving me that the neutral axis is a Y negative, meaning that it's not just not going up. So it's something that is not going up. Let me go back to here. So if I, this, if this is the point of where my neutral axis is, oh, sorry, the, my centroidal axis, and I'm using the tension stress to calculate where this Y is, and this Y is giving me negative, meaning that the, the neutral axis is below the centroidal axis. So it's something here in the compressive area. Well, not compressive area, but because you know we didn't know where, where the neutral axis is. So it means that it's not like in the straight case, in the straight beam, where, yeah, the centroidal axis no, is coincident, coincides with the neutral axis. But in this case, for our case of curved beams, the neutral axis is below the, the centroidal axis. And there is a one more important characteristic here is that the variation of stresses from compression to tension in this case is linear, and you're going to see it from the fundamental formula of, of stresses in a, in a straight beam. So it's just a straight line. However, when you see the formula to calculate the, uh, let's say, the y-axis, the, the position of the neutral axis you know, in the curved beam you know, is a quadratic formula somehow, even though I mentioned that, you know, don't consider that, but it's, it's a quadratic formula. And that means that if I take a square or a section of a curved beam, let me draw it. So 
So the thing is that I'm going to have the, sorry. I'm going to have the centroidal axis, which is going to be, let's put it in the middle. This is a take away from this, you know, so this is the centroidal axis. I'm going to have then the neutral axis that is going to be below the, 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 the centroidal axis, the central axis. I'm going to exaggerate it and put it below. Neutral axis. And it also means that if I wanted to see how the stresses develop from compression to tension, it's going to be something like this. So let me draw a vertical line. So you're going to find out this is kind of hard to say at the beginning, but I'm going to give you away the, the answer to this. This is something that does like this. Change this color to a better one. So the stresses now are not straight, a straight line, but now they form this kind of uh, quadratic uh, form. And also, one giveaway that I'm going to say right now is that when you're working with curved beams, even though uh, it might be possible. Actually, I draw this a little bit wrong because even though uh, this is the tension part, but uh, this is the compression part, let's put it in the way, let me write it down. You're going to find out that that the stresses in compression are going, can be way higher than the, well, the stresses in tension sometimes. So, so be careful with that. So, because these peaks can just, you know, at the, at the surface of the element of the bar, it, they just can ramp up really, really rapidly, you know, very pointed here. So that's something to be considered when calculating this type of beams. Is that so? Uh, imagine that how easy, not easy, but that the possibilities of a curved beam subjected to forces to break or to kind of to say to over to go beyond the, the yield stress no are way more possible than those in a straight beam. So careful with that. But, but now what that we know that this is the, the position of the let's say neutral axis. So we know where the neutral axis is and we can calculate, for example, how stress is developed and across that, that line. What questions do you have so far? Now I have give you three equations. Well, I have given you four, but uh, I have given you four. So, Calculate tension, calculate compression. If you can, if you don't know if your the point you are your in which you are calculating the stress is in tension or compression, you can calculate the position of the neutral axis. So this is the kind of this is the equation. But then you know one of the problems was or is okay. What's the value of the bars? Let's say cross section constant, and then bar cross, bar cross section constant. You know is something like a, you should have here kind of. Uh, we need to know how to calculate. And for that, I brought this. So this is the simple case of a square of a rectangular, let's say, cross section. And how to start to do that? Because that's the next question. So, okay, now I know where to calculate the you know, forces, uh, stresses, uh, position of the neutral axis, but then I need to do, know this, you know, h square or or this constant. So if I do, if it's not tabled, you know, you know, a table, then you know how to do it. And everything start, starts with this formula that I kind of we found out here for you. This one here. So I'm going to copy down this. Okay, I'm going to call it then. Yeah. To determine that h, h square or constant, uh, we need to know a few things from the geometry of the bar. So imagine that this is a, a curved beam. So this is you just cut 
made a cut on a curved beam, you have you know the radius of curvature. So this is the distance from R till the uh, the neutral axis. Let's put it in that way. Then you have you know kind of you no know, overall width, overall height, and then you have a, a differential element of area that is kind of the money the 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 magnitude of this would be dy times dA, uh, sorry, uh, dy times p, but then you know how to calculate it. Well, uh, we have presented a, an equation for that, and it's this one here. So basically, we need to calculate, okay, what's the area we're talking about, and you know what's how to define y or uh, the differential area in terms of y. Uh, basically, that's kind of the question or the main uh, focus of the problem here. So let, let's work with this. So if I want to calculate the h square for this section, so I'm going to take this formula, I'm going to say, OK, now um, I want to take this h square out. And it's going to be then, I'm going to send this a downwards, and then say this is equals to y square plus y. Yeah, good. I'm going to kind of rearrange this as we have it in some, some other parts. So. If I just you know, multiply, resolve this fraction here, I can call this kind of one divided by A, as we did it before, is R times Y square, R plus Y, the A. Good. And then having this, you know, R is not, this R is constant, so I can put this out. But I'm going to do some other rearrangement trick here. And I'm going to tell you which one it is. So I'm going to just take this R by R A area. It's going to be uh, Y square plus Y dA. So I'm going to add, add, and subtract, add, and subtract. R squared to this uh, upper part of the equation, upper part of the of this fraction here. And the reason for that is the follow. So I'm going to write it in green here. So if I have mm, try to explain this minus R square plus R square, I could transform this into uh, something like so. These two terms here are kind of a what's the name in English? Kind of a quadratic something kind of like binomial or something like that. But I can transform this into this one here. Those are square. Then if, if I multiply term a term, term kind of, uh, let's say if I, well, this is again, try to find uh, common terms here. So uh, what I can do is try to work with these two items here and try to transform it into something uh, kind of I want to separate this into a few uh, elements to be able to just get rid of actually this or mainly this part here in that sense. So what I'm going to do here is then take this part here and say that this is equals to actually if I try to transform this working with this I can rearrange this into this form. Because now having this part in this form, if I substitute it here, so I'm going to have within the integral or inside of the integral, I'm going to have three terms. And those three terms are going to be h square equals to r divided by a. That's going to be equal to uh, the first integral would be kind of this one here. Uh, but this one divided by this is going to be, and it's going to end up like something like this, y dA. Then the second term is this times kind of dA, and this one is going to be minus r dA. And plus kind of this is going to be r squared divided by these two. It's going to be dA. Now we have talked before that you know this term small, and then 
if I take the radius because it's constant, constant out, the integral of the a is going to be a. So it means that I can write down this in some other fashion, something like. R divided by a multiplies. Oh, sorry, this is an error. It multiplies then this term here, which is minus R a plus then this integral here. Now, if I continue, I am going to have that multiplying this times this and this times this. This is going to end up being uh, R cube. Kind of a multiply, kind of a positive term first, divided by A, then integral of the A by R minus, and this times this is only R square. So this is a simplified version of that formula there. I'm going to mark it out because this is important. Now, having this, what's happened with the rectangular section? Let me bring it down a little bit. The first question is, uh, who is uh, DA? So how can I characterize DA? So DA, I know it's going to be uh, this width times uh, the differential element of error. So that's that is the point of a, the section of a study that I'm kind of focused focus on right now. So this is going to be B time times dy. Good. Now, but who's going to be the area? So well, the area is going to be B times D. Then if I try to substitute everything into that, so uh, one thing that is going to appear definitely is that I, I would need to work with certain limits of integral limits here or integration limits here. So, but let me substitute everything once there. So if I have this equation, it means that then h square equals r cubed divided by the area, which is bd, already mentioned here, and then integrated over. If this is r, and then consider that r can vary you know, from this point to this point and to this point to this point, and I'm considering that it's in the middle of everything. So this can vary. You know, one of the ways to take the integration limits is could be kind of from this point to this point and from this point to this point. And that's going to be equivalent to say, well, this is going to go from minus d, half minus d to, to half d. And then who is going to be the A? Well, the A is going to be B, the Y, divided by this term here, Y minus R. And all of that, then at the end, I'm going to just subtract you no know, R square. This is E square. The B is a constant. I can kind of some sort of a, take out B from it. If I want to write it kind of a little bit better, it's going to be R square cube divided by BD times B then minus or half minus half D to half D which be Y divided by Y plus R all of these minus R square well this goes up this goes out and this is a kind of a tabled integral, if we want to call it in that way, which answer for that one is that, you know, the integral of all these terms is based on the natural logarithm of the fraction that you're presented here. So this in the end is going to be kind of what we have here, r cubed divided by t times the natural logarithm of that fraction, as I mentioned now. And that's going to be evaluated, you know, from minus half d to d to half d. minus r square.
And if you want to keep developing this, you're going to find out that this equals to skew, kind of just to, to, to do the integration limits on there to open up this, which is going to be the, the natural logarithm of the uh, d divided by two plus r minus natural logarithm of minus d divided by two plus r. Yeah. Minus r square. Good. Now, if you arrange a little bit this, you're going to find out that I'm just going to just because this is a very uh, let's say common form that you're going to find in the problems, you know, for these type of uh, problems with rectangular sections. So, but let me write it down again fast or quickly quickly here. So it's going to be just going to rearrange to to form it better. So natural logarithm of d plus two r divided by two minus natural logarithm of two r minus d divided by two minus r square. And then using the logarithm properties, then we can say that h square equals to r q divided by d. These two thing, these two here, these two cancel out. So this is going to be in the same natural logarithm of this one on the top, right there, to r divided by r minus d minus r square. And this is the value of of h square for, for a rectangular section. So meaning that, yeah, if you have a rectangular se section in your your curved beam, so it's pretty safe to come to this type of formula and use it and, and kind of re reuse it you know, whenever you, you find this type of problem. But if you change the type of section, then you, you have to come back to this formula here and you know start again asking, OK, who is the area? And then you know how much is the area? Who is the, the, the differential area? So how it's calculated? And you're going to find out that sometimes it will be tricky if you have, for example, trapezoid, trapezoidal uh, sections or circular sections or complex shaped sections or even sections such as presented here in the crane hook. So this is not a trivial section, let's put it in that way. So meaning that you know, whenever you have a section of such part, you can find constants that are kind of adequate to the section, but if not, you would have to uh, do it in this this way. Question so far. Sorry, could you go through where the uh, negative d over two and positive d over two come from exactly? This one here. Yeah, could you just show them on the diagram? In that sense. That um. Ah, okay. So, so I mean, the integration limits, basically, you say where they're coming from, is it? Yeah, exactly. OK, so the thing, the situation here is that, so we are considering that the, the neutral axis is here in the middle of the rectangular section. Yeah? Yeah. So this means that, if I put a line here, that this section divides uh, the area into two parts. And if I consider this as a, at my zero reference point here. So how much is from here to here? Well, I would say, well, I have to travel minus D2. Yeah, if I consider uh, this is a kind of a positive in this direction. Yeah. And then how much do I go from this point to the end of the of the surface? Well, this is, uh, I have to travel half of this D distance. Yeah. And then why is that? Because when I select a differential area here, so this differential area can grow from this part to the top or this part to the bottom. So when I take the integral of this and I just, you know, kind of consider, I, I'm trying to say that I'm kind of sweeping the whole area from this point to this point, but as my reference system is located here, then my integration limits has to be described like this. Is, uh, let's say, a reference system, uh, let's say, situation. If I put my reference system at the bottom, then let me put it here in another color. If I say, well, no, you know what? Maybe I, I miss you no know, explaining or saying that. If I say that this is, I'm kind of calculating everything from here, and this is my zero, 
the my integration limits are going to go from zero up to D because you're going to sweep the whole area. So yep, this is where right. the integration, you got it? Yeah, so it depends on where you measure Y from. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. thank you. Yeah, that's correct. No, thank you for the question. Good, and so far, well, um, so uh, summarizing, again, all these kind of, let's say that from all of these, from all these trick things, uh, even though I have the, the beautiful arranged uh, figures for for this whole procedure that, that those are the ones that I'm going to be uploading. I can share the PDF of this, but it's going to be recorded already. So, but imagine how how painful is the process of trying to formulate something out of you know nothing. So, uh, when I kind of a few years back when I kind of was introduced to this, I said, well, yes, now that is solved. It is pretty simple to see where things are coming from, but you know what I mentioned at the beginning. But when you try to find for information about this theory, you're going to find jumps, you know, kind of you have this equation and then it jumps to this equation and it jumps then back to this equation. So you don't know what exactly happened in the beginning. And sometimes knowing what's happening, what's happening in the beginning is something that would allow you to understand when doing certain calculations that you know what, I shouldn't consider this in this way because I know that within the formulation, it's not that you have to know the formulation, but it is that, you know, there are certain hints, certain, you know, messages that the formulation is telling you, hey, you know, consider this, hey, consider, oh, be careful with that. That I wanted to take, you know, this this session specifically to do it in this way, even though it's painful in the sense that, you no, know, it's, it's boring, I understand it's boring, I understand that it's maybe it's hard to follow, but to just to lay out things that you might have in your, no toolkit and you can use it later. Uh, but in the end, uh, it would be pretty easier just for me to say, you know what, if you want to calculate the beam, use this formula, use this formula, and you know, use this formula. And that's it. And then let's just do a bunch of exercises. Um, however, coming back to what I mentioned in our first class is, you know, and I said it very maybe bluntly was that, you know, you can Google it, you know, if you want to calculate a curve beam, you can Google it. But I am more interested in the core concepts that are those hints, those subtle messages that, you know, the, the formulations are telling you that as an engineer, you say, mm, you know what? Yeah, I can use that formula, but, you know, let me consider something. So let me see how, how the loading case on the beam is. So let me consider. So how is the situation with the section of the beam? So why? But you have the formula. Yeah, you know, I have the formula, but, you know, there are some cry for help in those kind of hints that it's going to give, be good for your career. And those are the core formulations that you need to have. So I promise that I will try to minimize this as much as possible so you won't have that many, let's say, operations on the screen. So, but I want to take the opportunity with this because when we start kind of doing calculations about the curve beams, so this is going to be important, important for you. So even though it's just you know, a few formulas. So I wanted to just summarize summarize and close the, the session today with those thoughts. I will be uploading the material, you know, after class. And uh, and then, you know, I'm welcome to any questions. Let me quickly quickly check the results of the of the there's no, there's no. just quickly. And I apologize if this kind of both causes any inconvenience from some of you guys, uh, because I understand that uh, many of you would have preferences, but, but I'm trying to do it as democratic as possible. Well, it's already published, so fortunately, I know that you know Wednesdays, so so we will have it on Wednesdays. Sorry about that. So we will try to to see how better it works. So for those who cannot attend the session on Wednesday because of their classes. Please feel free to contact me in the sense to to ask me for for clarifications regarding exercises and you know uh, how it was done or any doubts. You know, pretty much exercises should be self-explanatory, meaning that you could follow along and see uh, what what's the situation, how it's developing, and what's happening uh, in during the solution exercise. But if at some point definitely you find out that mm, I don't understand why this was done, then you know, of course you are more than welcome to. To show to 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 have to, to ask me, that sense. Questions? Well, if not, I would like to wish you guys um, a very good weekend. Enjoy your weekend. Um, fortunately, we will start with the exercises next week. 
and uh, yeah, take care. Let's close it, let's wrap it up. Bye.